Good morning. I'm glad to be with you today on this autumn Sunday via this imperfect technology, but this is one of the ways that we gather, keeping each other safe uh, during this difficult time. I'm actually taping these remarks to you on Friday morning, and I wanted to tell you that for two reasons. One, in the last weeks, my neighbors, whose house is right back there, since my office is in a small cottage in my backyard, um, have decided to put an addition on the back of their house. And um, that means occasionally when I'm taping, there'll be a lot of noise. So if you hear something that sounds like construction, it's the neighbors. And what I'd like you to do is just think of us as being in a church together and the baby starts crying. So we'll try to work with, with that sound um, as much as it is possible to do. The second reason that I wanted to tell you that I'm recording on Friday is because in the last several weeks as I've preached, I've recorded on Thursday or Friday. And by the time we've arrived at Sunday, something very extraordinary has happened in the news. And that's how it's been for weeks on end. Every day, something happens that seems as if the world is shifting. So when I was talking to your assistant rector, Jesse, uh, she was telling me uh, that there was a sense of anxiety in your congregation and in your community. And I sort of laughed and I said, well, isn't that the case for everyone? Indeed, I got a text today from a younger friend, and uh, that person had been up most of the night looking up how it might be possible for a president of the United States to launch a nuclear attack without any guardrails. And my friend is in her 20s. So I would say that's anxiety. We're all feeling anxious. When I looked at the text for today, I read the gospel, which is a really challenging and amazing parable in Matthew. And I thought, well, that'll be good because I love challenging passages. But then I felt my own anxiety. And I thought about the anxiety that so many people I know were sharing. And I read the words from Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. So I said to Jesse, I'm preaching on that. I want to preach on Philippians because who doesn't need to be reminded of these amazing words? Rejoice, gentleness, the nearness of God. Do not worry, but instead let your prayer and supplication be known to God. Indeed, these words might seem very familiar to you. They're words that show up on greeting cards and sometimes posters hanging around Sunday school rooms in church basements. These are words that are in songs, hymns, choruses that are sung. And so they're very, they're very familiar. As a matter of fact, they're so familiar that when we read them in the epistle to the Philippians, we might pass right by them. It's like, oh yes, there's Paul. He's just saying nice things to his friends at Philippi. And we forget that there is a context behind them. And that context is really important for digging deep into not only the words, but also seeing how important these words are and how meaningful they are um, in relationship to our current struggles. The background for this passage is not just friendship. Um, people do refer to the epistle to the Philippians as Paul's most joyful letter. He clearly likes these people. He 
he is trying to communicate with them um, his fond regard and his real um, joy is the only real uh, is the only word we have his his happiness his sense of that it's a gift to be in ministry with them and so there is this lilting almost lightness to this letter the whole way through and it contains some of Paul's most be beautiful passages including the passage where Jesus Christ gave up he emptied himself of all that he was and came into this world um, to be with us the beautiful passage that was read just um, last week so here we are with these these words that in a, in a sense seem just kind of the final benediction as it were in a letter of Paul to people he really likes and that's all true but it is also true that the setting for this letter is conflict indeed you get a sense of that at the very beginning of the, the passage that um, is read today it just says it, before the part about rejoicing Paul urges two women to be of the same mind in the Lord. Indeed, scholars have speculated over the years that these two women might have been having a fight. And so these lovely words might have been written in the context of a church conflict where Paul's trying to resolve tensions between two members of the congregation who are clearly leading members of the congregation. Paul mentions them by name, and he also talks about how they are his, uh, they share with him, they're his yoke fellows in, in ministry. So that is part of what's going on in this letter. But there's a larger conflict that's even behind that church conflict. And the larger conflict is represented by the fact that Paul is writing this letter from jail. Indeed, there are seven letters in the New Testament that scholars from every tradition recognize as being authentically written by the Apostle Paul. And then there are a few others that may have been written by Paul or were written by someone very close to Paul claiming his name. And then there are a couple that are written much later in Paul's, um, using Paul's, Paul's name. But this letter right here, Philippians, this letter is one of those seven original letters. And it is also the last one of those seven letters chronologically. It was written in the mid fifties and Paul uh, was in a Roman prison he, it follows on the heels of Philemon, that short letter where we mostly know it because of Paul's short discussion about slavery. And um, in Philemon, Paul is also in prison. And in the letter of Philemon, Paul seems to indicate that he's going to get out of jail. But in this letter, in Philippians, the tone changes just a bit. And Paul no longer is quite so sure that he's going to be freed. As a matter of fact, there are hints and indications in this letter that Paul is worried that he's going to be executed. And so why is that a conflict? Well, of course, this is a conflict because this the setting for this letter is not only some small quarrel in a church between two women who can't seem to get along. But the larger conflict is the conflict between Christianity and the Roman state. It's a political conflict. And Paul is part of that conflict. That the imperial state is, is opposed to the spread of Christianity. That the emperor does not want uh, Christianity to be able to become an important player in in this in the life of the state 
And so the, the, the state is trying to stamp Christianity out at this point and getting rid of major leaders, um, securing the power of the, of the state over the growing church is what is here. And so the state and the church are not getting along. The, the church is persecuted. And Paul, who is so loved by these people in Philippi, uh, Paul is writing them from prison. They're, these people are anxious. They are anxious about what is going on within their churches. There is some sort of argument that has developed. And they are very anxious about the politics that is surrounding the church. So anxious that they're worried about the end of their own lives. This letter, these words, were penned in that situation. A situation of anxiety, internal anxiety in their own congregation, and external anxiety about the fate of the church, and in relation to that, their own fate. Paul thinks he, he might not live very long after the penning of this particular letter to his friends. He's worried he's going to die. Now, as such, this becomes Paul's farewell letter to his friends. Now, I want you all to take a breath because these are things that I have spent the last six months worried about. We have had conflict in our churches, conflict about how much do we put in line online? There's been conflict in the Episcopal Church about whether or not one could celebrate the Eucharist at home or, th or through the internet. And there's been big arguments, even in the House of Bishops, about this. Uh, and so we've had a family conflict where people are feeling so stressed that there's internal arguing. And there's also internal arguing in a lot of congregations that I know about um, the political moment, uh, issues around racism, issues around um, economic fairness, um, issues around, that have been introduced through the political cycle that we're in. And that brings us to this bigger thing, is that we are in the middle of a big political conflict, one which is having an extraordinary impact on churches. And we are in the middle of a large, not conflict, but we're in the middle of a pandemic that has introduced to all of us the possibility that we might not be here much longer. That if we caught this illness, we are all afraid about going to the hospital, what will happen to us, the course of the illness, and whether or not we would survive. Indeed, the church I was preaching at last weekend had lost, I believe, if memory serves me, six members of their congregation to COVID. And so what we find here in this letter to the Philippians, these beautiful words, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Paul isn't writing those words from some place of security, from some place where he knows that everything's going to be fine, where he's just this deeply faithful, trusting apostle. No. He's writing them in the midst of times where he may be feeling rather like you are today. Paul understands anxiety. The churches that he founded understood anxiety. And they were trying to figure out what does it mean to follow Jesus amid anxiety. 
And so let me just look at these words more specifically and give you a sense of, of what Paul tells them. And um, it, is, it is amazing. I'm going to share with you uh, just a quick reading of the passage, not from the familiar version of the New Revised Standard uh, that we use in, in church reading, but this is a, a translation of it from David Bentley Hart, who is a philosopher, who has written a new translation of the New Testament based out of the what he speculates were the Aramaic uh, forms of of these letters. Um, Aramaic, of course, being the original language that Jesus did speak in the in the in the Gospels. And and uh, what uh, David Bentley Hart tries to do is go back to the most ancient of texts and reconstruct what the language that he believes is closest to the language uh, that would have been used by Paul and Jesus. And so uh, I'm going to just start a little further into the passage with uh, verse four. Um, this is the way Hart's translation reads. Uh, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say it. Rejoice. Let your fairness be known to all human beings. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but rather in everything, let your petitions be known to God by prayer and supplication, accompanied by thanksgiving. And the peace of God that surpasses every mind will keep watch over your hearts and your thoughts in the anointed one, Jesus. As to the rest, brothers, whatever things are true, whatever grand, whatever right, whatever pure, whatever lovely, whatever of good repute, if there be any virtue and any praise, ponder these things. Those things that you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, put these into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Again, if we don't stop and savor those words, they become a little like um, greeting cards. And I just want to uh, take a couple minutes here and help you savor them. The passage actually divides up into three parts. The first part being that instruction uh, to the two women to be of the same mind. And then you move into this second part where uh, Paul is starting to list uh, these, these beautiful words. And that really starts with verse four. Let uh, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And part of the reason I, I break it there is because that word rejoice actually can also mean farewell. Now you might think to yourself, what? Um, the farewell and rejoice, those are two entirely different things. But it's a little like French when you can say, I do, you know, which means goodbye or farewell. Um, and it also means uh, essentially God be with you. And so that's what this word is um, in the New Testament. It can mean rejoice or it can mean uh, farewell. And there are some uh, versions of the New Testament that do translate it as farewell, highlighting the fact that this is, in effect, Paul's last will and testament to the Philippians. And so it's a benediction. And the benediction is, first of all, in verses 4 uh, through, uh, four through 7, and then it will pick up in a different way in verse eight. And so it's, it's, it's a fairly interesting passage. It's like two benedictions in a row. And so this is the first one, uh, rejoice in the Lord always, or you might say rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say farewell. So we can put both words in there. Now in our translation that we read in the Episcopal church, it says, let your gentleness be known uh, to everyone. But the word there, gentleness, actually bears this other meaning that heart brings out. Let your fairness, your equanimity, let those things be known to everyone. Now, I don't know about you all, but gentleness, fairness, and equanimity are the very last things that I'm seeing right now every time I turn on social media. 
indeed, this little word, gentleness, bears an additional um, sense of meaning. And that is the justice that goes beyond ordinary justice. And so what Paul is telling his friends at the beginning of this benediction, this farewell address, his last will and testament, is let your sense of fairness, let your sense of equanimity, let your commitment to the justice that is beyond ordinary justice, let that be known by everyone. This is no greeting card. This is not a sentimental statement. This is Paul giving a moral instruction to this community. Be of this sort of community. Be this kind of people. Fair. Balance. Equanimitable. To be full of equity. And let your justice go beyond ordinary justice. And so after that line, let your gentleness be known by everyone. So how, how, how does that happen? I mean, how does that happen in a community with conflict that's under siege from the Roman Empire? How, how do you let yourself be known as being people who are, are fair, who have this sense of equanimity, who are committed to a justice even in a time when ordinary justice has failed? Well, Paul says, because the Lord is near. And it is the nearness of the Lord that will liberate you from worry. And that's what our translation says, worry. Uh, Hart's translation it says it will liberate you from anxiety. And what I love about this word in Greek is that the word anxiety actually means to go to pieces. And so that's what I was sharing with you at the very beginning about the text from my young friend. My young friend was literally going to pieces because of what was happening in the news. That's the word here. Paul says that if you pursue the kind of gentleness, the kind of fairness, the justice that goes beyond ordinary justice that is based in the ever-present Lord, it will liberate you from the possibility of falling to pieces And instead give you the power to pray, to offer your supplications, your entreaties to God, and to give thanks. And it is in this, this movement, that peace then will guard your heart like a sentinel. And so that's a, a benediction. It's a farewell. I'm getting ready to send you on your way with God's blessings. Let your gentleness be known to all. The peace of the Lord be with you. That's like we do in our benedictions. And then he goes on and he explains a little theolo theologically. Why, how can you trust that gentleness is going to be near you? The Lord is near you. You can do this. The Lord is near. That will free you. Be free from that anxiety. You don't need to fall apart in the middle of this storm. But instead, you can turn around and you can, with confidence, offer your prayer and supplications to God and trust that peace then will guard your hearts like a sentry. And so, farewell. Do these things. This is why. This is the result. And peace will be your end. That in itself, just those three short lines, that's a benediction. But then you get to this other point in verse 8. And, and this is where I think that Paul really, who Paul is really comes out. Because he's not content giving the Philippians just one benediction. He gives them two. It's like, oh, well, wait a second. I, I might never see these people again. I might never be able to write them another letter. I better tell them what else is on my mind. And so then comes this part, as to the rest, my brothers, that's in the Hartley, the David Bentley Hart uh, translation. And, uh, you know, in, in ours, it says, finally, 
So he's he said farewell already, but he's going to say farewell again. Okay, well, finally. And then he lists these six things. Um, he says, uh, whatever things are, and uh, I love this list. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful list. Whatever is true, this is the Bentley Hart again. Whatever is true, whatever is grand, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute. He says, um, these are the things. These are the things. Remember these things. It's, it's basically, he's probably reciting to them a list of character traits that he taught to them in person. Um, these kinds of lists of character traits, very common in the ancient world. Uh, Greeks had them, Romans had them in their different religious traditions, Jews had them. These are the ways that you're supposed to live if you're a person of good character. And I'm. it, it should be no surprise that Christians took this tradition and incorporated it into life in Christ, um, as Paul is indicating here. And so the, the words that we have in our, our reading are true, honorable, just, pure, pleasing, and commendable. And uh, again, these are not just greeting card kinds of words. These are amazing words. Um, indeed, the word true means hold to the facts of the matter. Be factual in your interactions with one another. Truthful. I don't know about you, but I can't think of an, a, a better and more powerful injunction for the church. Be honorable. Be dignified in the way that you treat one another and treat others with dignity. Be just. Keep the commandments, be upright, and justice, of course, related to let your gentleness be known to all in that paragraph above in the previous benediction. Be pure, that is, cling to what is sacred and holy. Don't let yourself be defiled by the conflicts and the evil of the days. Hold to whatever is pleasing. And I love this word. It bears the, the dimensions of whatever is lovely, whatever you prize, whatever is worthy of your embrace. And then finally, what is commendable? Everything that is admirable or laudable. Hold to those things. And then Paul sums those two things up. He goes on and he says, um, if there be any virtue, in our version it says whatever is excellent, and that word is also the word for moral virtue in Greek. So he's saying all of these things, these are virtues. Whatever is a virtue, hold to that. And then he says whatever is praiseworthy. And that's, in a sense, repeating that word commendable, but it says whatever is a virtue, by which praise is bestowed on a people. Whatever is praiseworthy, whatever is excellent, a moral virtue, and whatever is praiseworthy, whatever bestows praise on a community or a people. And Paul ends then by saying, these things, think on them. And that word is ponder. Ponder. Ponder truth, dignity, purity, what is pleasing, commendable, and just. Those virtues, those things which are praiseworthy, ponder those. And then the best line of all. Don't just ponder them, but put them in practice. And then Paul says, if you do that, the peace of God will be with you. And so there you go. That's Philippians. These few short verses, which we sometimes pass over, because they remind us of something we may have read on a greeting card at some point in time, 
or seen on a poster in a church Sunday school room. These are the words of Paul, the authentic ancient words of the amazing apostle who had met Jesus on a road and had his life turned upside down. And then who lived his life of ministry in a particular time of conflict, a conflict which is even under the most joyful letter that he writes in the whole of the New Testament, a conflict within the church and conflict surrounding the church. And what does he say? He, he, he redirects the attention of the people who are following Jesus away from the conflict towards the long-for peace of God and offering them in successive benedictions a vision of a life of equity and true justice, a life that does not fall apart in the face of conflict, but instead a life that can pursue the beauty of virtue through reflection and practice. And if those are Paul's words for us today, well, I can't do any better. This is an amazing vision. And whatever happens between the time I record these remarks on Friday morning and the time that we're together on Sunday, they are true. Let your gentleness be known to all. Practice these six virtues, and the peace of God will be with you. Amen.